Good morning, everyone. I'm John. I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary. I'm so glad to open the Word of God with you today. Earlier this week, NASA's SpaceX Crew-4 launched from the Kennedy Space Center and began a 16 and a half hour space flight to the International Space Station aboard the Crew Dragon Freedom spacecraft. We all have a personal connection to this mission because one of the four crew members, Dr. Jessica Watkins, grew up here at Calvary's Boulder campus. Jess's parents, Michael and Carolyn, are members today at the Erie campus. Jessica has been part of the NASA astronaut program since 2017. It's her first time in space, and her time aboard the space station will be spent doing all sorts of scientific experiments around her field, which is geology. Jessica is the first African-American woman to experience long-term space flight aboard the space station. She'll be in space for about six months, returning to Earth in September. You can follow her mission on NASA's website. It's amazing. I watched the launch and the docking of the space like HD video where you can see the whole thing happen. It's amazing. After they docked with the space station, Jessica was asked what her favorite part of her first space flight was. She said, it had to be the view. <laughs> Can you imagine? Jessica is experiencing what astronauts call the overview perspective, a view of our world from orbit, getting to see our world in a way that no one else does, and that many of them say has a profound impact on them even after they returned from space. Their perspective about our world changes when they get to see that view. The text we're gonna look at today in our study of James also has a unique perspective about our world. When we open the Bible, the Bible talks about the world in a few different ways. It speaks about it in a way that's similar to that overview perspective like the world and everything that's in it in a physical way. All of God's creation that exists in the world. That's a physical description of the world and the Bible talks about the world in that way a lot. It also talks about the world in a geographical way. We think of uh, some of Jesus' final words to his disciples, go therefore into all the world and make disciples of all nations. These are the tribes and tongues and nations that make up our world. So those are two common ways that we might think of the world and a common way that the Bible talks about the world in a physical way and in a geographical way too. But the Bible also describes the world in sort of a social or cultural way. That idea of the world is what we're gonna see today as we continue our Mark It Up series in the book of James. The, this biblical idea of the world, which isn't only in the book of James, understands the world as anything that is opposed to God's will and his purposes. This could be ideas in the world that are against God's ideas. These could be the cultural forces and movements that oppose what the Bible says about moral issues. They could be people who live in a way that is knowingly or unknowingly antagonistic or opposed to God. So if you have your Bible, grab it and turn with me to James chapter four. Maybe you have a journal, maybe you're opening the Bible on your smartphone. However you open the Bible, it will help you and it'll help me if you're looking at the text while we're studying it together. So James chapter four and beginning in verse four. If you've been around with us for our study in the book of James, maybe you've noticed the affection that James has for his readers, for his audience. He calls them brothers and sisters. At times he says, my beloved brothers and sisters. 
So the way verse four of chapter four begins is a little bit of a shock when James says, you adulterous people. Aren't you glad you came to church today? (laughs) This is like how to win friends and influence people by the brother of Jesus. You adulterous people. We'll circle back to this phrase in a moment, but let's continue reading verse four. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself or herself an enemy of God. Like he often does, James compares two options in our text today. Essentially, two ways to live. As friends of the world, which according to James makes us enemies of God, or as friends of God, which might make us enemies of the world. James captures the attention of his readers by using these bold words because he knows that friendship with the world compromises our friendship with God. Our modern view of friendship is way different than the ancient one. Our idea of friendship today is kind of casual, maybe at best non-committal. Friends come and go. We've got friends in all different spheres of our life. Some of us would say we have work friends, like they are only our friends when we're at work. They get a different job than probably our relationship with them fades. They're just work friends. We probably all have Christmas card friends. We only hear from them once a year when we're annoyed at their extensive Christmas letter that they send. We don't hear from them again, but we would call them friends. I mean, today we have internet friends. People who we only follow on Instagram or Twitter, but we have and can develop a relationship with them. There are times when I'll ask Lindsay, do you know this person? I heard this name today and she'll say, oh, we're Facebook friends. Like, I'm not even really sure what that means. You have a a friend on this app, but we call them friends. A different. It was a serious relational commitment You shared a lot together. So when James describes friendship with the world, it isn't some sort of, oh, he's my friend, we've hung out a couple times sort of relationship. This is like, I am deeply committed to her. Maybe a better way to understand James's use of the word friend here is like, this is my best friend. I am deeply invested in this relationship. We share everything together. They know me better than anyone. That's the kind of friendship that James means. And so then, because of that, we could understand why friendship with the world and its ideas might be in conflict with friendship with God. That kind of deep, committed friendship with the world is just simply in conflict with the life of a Christian. Because the world, in this context, is in direct opposition to God. In fact, James says back in verse four that whoever wishes to be a friend of God, or I'm sorry, to be a friend of the world, makes himself or herself an enemy of God. Whoever wishes, desires, to be a friend of the world. That means it becomes like the ruling desire of our heart, more important than anything else. That the things of the world are what we want more than anything. The temptations that can be common to all of us. Like who isn't tempted by things like power or pleasure, possessions or prestige? These are the things of the world that can be so alluring to us. 
We see people who occupy positions of power and we think, oh, it's good to be the king. We're bombarded with messages that pleasure is what life is all about and the pursuit of it. Whether it's food, alcohol, sex or vacation, pleasure is what it's all about. And possessions could be the newest toys or it could simply be material, material wealth. Those things can become all-consuming for us. We even saw in our study of chapter three of James how the self-centered pursuit of prestige or what James calls selfish ambition can lead to all kinds of disorder and evil in the world. These are the things we might wake up in the morning thinking about, spend our days striving after, go to sleep longing for. But there are some more subtle ways that we can find friendship with the world too. And James has touched on some of those that might be less immediately obvious to us. The first part of James chapter two was all about favoritism. One of the ways that manifests itself in our world today is discrimination. Do you ever wonder why racism would exist today in our modern society? Still exist in our country after so many years? It's because the world is in opposition to God's will and his purposes. And friends of God ought to stand up against those worldly forces. Another subtle way we might drift toward friendship with the world is that first part of James 3 that we saw, how we can blow things up with our words without even meaning to. That's a way we might develop friendship with the world. And that second part of that chapter talks about selfish ambition and the evils that come from it. Even last week in the first part of chapter four, we had a reminder that basically we don't get what we want in the world and that creates conflict. And we become the center of our own little universe and then we fight and quarrel with others, even inside the church, because we don't get what we want. That's friendship with the world. And when those kinds of things, when those desires become ruling desires, we become, according to James, enemies of God, opposed to God's goodwill and purpose. And what happens when God's people drift to become friends of the world? Check out verse five. Or do you suppose, James says, it is to no purpose that the scripture says he, that's God, yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. When God's people drift to become friends of the world, God becomes jealous. Not jealous like a child who's upset that their sibling got a toy that they wanted and they didn't, but jealous for our love and affection because he made us and he made us to look to him as the most important thing in our life. It says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. I think, I think you could take that a couple different ways. I think that might be the Holy Spirit that God allows to indwell in us at the moment that we call on the name of the Lord Jesus for salvation. The Holy Spirit indwells every follower of Christ. And God might yearn jealously over that spirit that he doesn't want our heart to be divided, to use the language of James. Some also take this verse to think about the spirit as like the spirit that's in every human. The gift of life that God grants to every human being at conception that sets us apart from every other created being. Either way, God has created all people for him and for his purposes. And whenever we live in opposition to that, God is described as jealous for our love. 
Now, James says that this idea is in the scripture. It's not an exact quote, but it essentially summarizes this idea that's common in the Old Testament, the jealousy of God for his people, the people that he has created and whom he calls to be faithful to him. Remember that punch in the face uh, phrase that we saw at the beginning? You adulterous people. That's language of a marriage relationship, which is a common metaphor that the scripture uses to describe God's relationship with his people. For example, the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter three says this, but like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, God's chosen people, have been unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. That's adultery. And the New Testament people of God are referred to as the bride of Christ. So when we trade friendship with God for friendship with the world, essentially, James says, we commit spiritual adultery. Friendship with the world compromises our friendship with God. So we read that God's jealous for our love and we're confronted as perhaps being adulterous people. Again, you're glad you came to church today, right? Does James have our attention? Look at verse six with me though. What does verse six say? But he gives more grace. God gives more grace. There's always more grace from God. We can't use up God's supply of grace. He doesn't have a limited amount, and once we reach a certain point, we're cut off. He doesn't withhold it. He never takes it away. He gives more and more and more of it to us. And we don't earn it. He doesn't say to us, I need you to do the following things, and then I'll give you more grace. Now, what does Ephesians 2, 8 say? For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. Grace is a gift that God loves to give. And not just one time, but over and over and over again, he gives more grace. So if you've recently felt drawn to the world, And who amongst us hasn't? God wants to give you grace today to turn back to him. And with his help, you can say, God, I don't want to be a friend of the world. I want to be a friend of God. And he is gracious to forgive and to welcome you back. And maybe you're here today and you've never in your life considered yourself a friend of God. And you think, there's no way that I could be called a friend of God. Not after the way I've lived. Not after what I've said about God. Not not after what I've done in my life. Here's what Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we've now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Christ died for you while you were a sinner. Not after you cleaned your life up, Not after you got your act together, but while you were actively an enemy of God. He gives more grace. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how far you feel you've drifted from God, God gives you more grace. God loves you. So we've seen what it means to be a friend of the world. 
But what is it like to be a friend of God? Friends of God have some things in common. And in verses 6 through 10, which have about 10 direct commands, James loves to give us advice. James gives us three traits that are common to friends of God. Friends of God are humble. Friends of God are honest. And friends of God are holy. Humble, honest, holy. He starts in the second part of verse 6 by saying, Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This is more of a direct quote from the Old Testament, Proverbs 3, verse 34. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Friends of God are humble. It takes humility to come before the Lord and to recognize that we have been living as friends of the world. And therefore, is God's enemies. And pride, which this text says God opposes, can be one of the more subtle types of sin. It's even one of the few kinds of sin we might admire. It's hard to admire murder. Hard to admire other kinds of grievous sins. But pride... We see prideful people, and oftentimes we're drawn to them. We think, man, she really tells it like it is. Or I don't really agree with everything he says, but he sure gets stuff done. I admire that. We see pride often and call it courage or bravery and might aspire to be more and more like that. And the consequences of pride can be severe. Some of the examples from the scripture are kind of spectacular of prideful leaders and the way that God deals with them. Of course, the classic one is Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Moses goes to him multiple times and asks him to let his people go so they can go freely worship the rightful Lord and king, their God. And Pharaoh continually hardens his heart. He succumbs to pride and does not allow the people of God to freely go. And it's this escalating conflict between the power of God and the pride of Pharaoh. And God increasingly stands in opposition to him until he delivers his people from bondage in Egypt. And the people of God plunder the Egyptians on their way out. And God makes Pharaoh look like a fool. God is opposed to the proud. One of my favorite things I've read during our study in the book of James is written by an English Puritan pastor from the 1600s named Thomas Manton. His exposition of the book of James is incredible. He makes the point that pride can be an especially tempting sin, especially for the mature Christian. Because hopefully as we grow as followers of Christ, we put the ways of the world behind us and we increasingly sin less in our life than we did prior to knowing Jesus. It's not that we ever totally eliminate sin from our life and become sinless. But as we grow in the likeness of Christ, we sin less. And that can lead to pride. The problem is, is we sin less. Pride can just creep into our life, and we think, I'm pretty good at this thing of life. Pretty good at following Jesus. I'm not like those people who sin in these ways anymore. Manton says, remember, whatever we have was given by grace, and if we grow proud of it, it will soon be taken away by justice. If we think, he says, that we might be immune from pride, don't forget that pride once crept into heaven. It was pride that caused Satan and a legion of angels to fall from the glorious presence, the holiness of God, into hell. Pride. God opposes the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. When we humble ourselves, God is gracious to us. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, the Apostle Peter says. Friends of God are humble. And in verse 7 in James 4, that humility is described in this way. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submitting ourselves to God takes humility because we submit our lives to his authority. We recognize his rule and reign in our lives, and we humbly serve him. And we increasingly want what he wants. We desire his will for our life. We conform our lives to the image of his son. Begin to reflect his. That's because a humble heart mirrors God's heart. And submitting here doesn't mean like passively giving up. It's the same word that would be used to describe a person who willingly enlists in the military. There's an allegiance here when we submit our lives to God, when we desire friendship with him, and that takes some humility. And when our allegiance shifts from friendship with the world to friendship with God, we will naturally resist the devil. And the promise of God is that he will flee from us so we don't live in fear. And then James reminds us in verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It also takes humility to draw near to God. The proud have no place in the presence of God. One of the most important ways that we draw near to God is through prayer. Nothing more so than humility to be able to say to God, God, I need you. I need help. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours, God, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's the way that Jesus taught his friends to pray when they asked him how to do it. And that prayer is such an example of humility. To say to God, God, you are the king of my life. And I submit myself under your authority. And I need you to help me with my daily needs. And I need help in forgiving other people. And most of all, God, I need your help. Because you and you alone can forgive me of my trespasses, my sins. Friends of God are humble, first of all. And second of all, they are honest. Honest because, as the rest of verse 8 says, we're commanded to cleanse your hands, you sinners, James says, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Honesty to confess our sins to God and to others. Honest about what's going on in our life. He knows. He's not surprised. So we don't try to hide. We don't try to excuse. We're honest with God about our sin. That's what this language from James is all about. It pulls on these Old Testament metaphors of cleansing and purification. Cleansing our hands has this idea of outward visible actions. Perhaps these are the sins in our life that others might see as we live as friends of the world. And God calls us to cleanse ourselves from those hearts, from those sort of inward secret sins that maybe other people won't see. I think also cleansing and purifying has an idea of confession and repentance, turning away. So friends of God, saying along with David in Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. We confess our sin and we repent of our sin. Repentance is a one-time turn in the life of every Christian to turn away from a life of sin and turn to God. And then it becomes a lifetime trend where we're constantly turning back to him, recalibrating, renewing that spirit within me as we honestly confess our sins. 
Because we all recognize we have all fallen short of the glory of God. This text is so perfect for us as we prepare our hearts to remember the death of Jesus during communion today. Who died for our sins so that we might be purified and cleansed before God. So as we're even thinking about taking communion together, it's good for us to make an honest assessment of ourselves. Where do we stand before God today? And if necessary, to confess to him and repent of our sin. Verse 9 says, as we do so, this is the kind of attitude we ought to have. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Here, here James goes again with his harsh advice. Why does he use the language of grieving when he's talking about sin? I think it's because James knows how the world makes light of it. The world laughs at sin and, does it take, and doesn't take it nearly as seriously as God does. The world tolerates or ignores sin, legally sanctions it, even encourages it. But sin is so serious that God sent his son to save us from it. And James says, as we consider our own sin in our life, let's not be like the world and laugh it off. But let's remember the, the serious consequences of our sin and be somber as we consider it. So friends of God are humble, friends of God are honest, and friends of God are holy. In verse 10, James concludes our text by saying, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Holiness is not something we achieve on our own. It is the work of God accomplished through his son, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus died for our sins. To pay the penalty of death and then to prove that the penalty had been paid, God raised him from the dead. And through that work, all who call on the name of Jesus for salvation will be made holy in the eyes of God. No longer his enemies, but his eternal friends. Cleansed and purified by the blood of our Savior and his Son, Jesus. When we each humbly receive the gift of salvation offered to us through Jesus, God exalts us to not only be his friend, but to be a part of his family, redeemed by his Son and forgiven forever, and brought near to our Father, confident to be able to stand in his presence, holy, because of the accomplishment of Jesus on the cross. Are you a friend of God? This is the most important relationship you will ever have in your life. More important than the relationship with your best friend. More important than the relationship with your children or even your parents. If you're married, more important even than the relationship with your spouse. Because friendship with God is an eternal relationship. One that lasts forever, but begins here on the earth. And we can't wait until it's all over and stand before God and say, I lived life the way I wanted to, and now I'd like to be your friend. That's not the way it works. God calls us here and now to friendship with him to receive the free gift of salvation that he offers to anyone who would call on the name of his son, Jesus, and find salvation. And there is salvation under no other name under heaven than the name of Jesus. And God calls every person, everywhere, to humbly submit to his authority and to ask Jesus to save us from our sins. And when we do that, when we humble ourselves, when we're honest with God about our need for salvation, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, and to make us holy. 
My friends, the world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. Friendship with God is an eternal relationship. And if you consider yourself a friend with God, because you have called on the name of Jesus for salvation, we are going to share a meal together today. A meal that is meant to be shared by the friends of God, by those who have humbly submitted to his authority in our lives, who have recognized and who are gladly members of his kingdom. And we get to share this meal as one family together. Brothers and sisters in Christ, unified together under the name of Jesus, friends of God, and part of his eternal family. He does call us to be honest with him before we eat and drink, to take a moment and search our hearts and ask for forgiveness so that we would eat this meal in a manner that's worthy of everything that we remember together when we do. The death of our Savior, the Son of God, Jesus. Friends of God, enjoy this meal together because of what it represents for us, that God in his grace has made us holy through the sacrifice So it's been a minute since we've passed communion together in our services. So let's have a little refresher about how this is going to go. If you're helping to serve, would you come forward? Our servers will pass to you trays first, which will be filled with bread. You're going to take a piece and hold on to it. Take a few minutes as it's all passed together. And then we'll eat together as one. During those moments as the elements are being passed, that might be a time for you to just make an honest assessment of your standing before God, and if needed, ask for his forgiveness, and remember he's faithful and just to forgive your sins. And after the bread's served, we'll all eat together, and then we'll serve the cup in a similar way. We'll wait together to drink all together as we worship Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we're eager to share this meal together as your friends. We give you thanks, God, that we do so to proclaim the death of our Savior, Jesus, to remind ourselves and to declare to the world that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for our sins, and that by calling on his name, we have been saved. And so we celebrate together all that Jesus has accomplished for us. And I pray, God, as we eat and drink and remember the sacrifice of your son, that you would nourish us. Help us, God. Correct us where we need correction. Encourage us where we need strength. Remind us of your love when we feel alone. God, we bless you for the chance to eat and drink together. And we do so under the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
The first time this meal was shared together was when the friends of God were gathered the night that Jesus was betrayed. And he took the bread and blessed it and gave thanks for it and said, this body is given for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me.
psalmist writes, what shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people. Drink in remembrance of your Savior. Amen.